question here. Clint, your dad passed away. Uh, very sorry for your loss. My condolences. Prayers are with you. Appreciate that. Uh, what is something that he left you with as far as a knowledge, a bit of knowledge or a lesson? Um, you know, my, my dad, you know, I, don't think, I don't think I realized how much my dad taught me at the time until I got older and had kids. Um, and, and I think, you know, as I got older and had kids, it, it changed my opinion on, on everything. So, you know, my dad was, uh, absolute outstanding athlete. And, and, and as far as I remember a point in my, my dad's, in my life that my dad was only 365 pounds. So it's like six foot tall. So that would have been in his forties. He was about 365. And then he spent most of his years in life well over 400 pounds um, at six foot tall or, or, show, or so. And I remember him at 365 and 400 uh, playing basketball. I remember him dancing. Uh, I remember him at the skating rink, like full on out skating the teenagers in his classroom. Um, just you know, uh, amazing stuff. And, and I remember that, um, I remember meeting people that would say, cause my dad would say, yeah, I was a good athlete in, in, in school. And then I would meet people that would talk about playing against him in football. And they couldn't even like explain what they would just be like, man, I, we, nobody could even touch your dad. I mean, it was just, a, it was crazy. Like he had moves that were just, how is he so fast? How did he hit so hard? How did he move us that way? How did he jump that high? And I'm looking at my dad like, my dad's a, you know, a big, strong kind of fat guy, you know? Uh, and then I would see him play basketball and just, you know, play like crazy. Um, and then, you know, he always mentioned about how good he was at baseball. And when I was real young, I tried to play baseball for many years. I was just terrible. Um, and I remember, you know, waking up, you know, in a summer morning, he would wake me up and we would go outside and we had a chain link fence all the way around our house, a big piece of property with chain link fence all the way around the house. And the goal was, you know, every time there was a little rod, you know, you'd stand 20, 30 feet away and you've got the ball, you throw it up and you, you hit it. Uh, and he was like, okay, I want you to hit the ball and I want you to hit that rod. And I want you to hit that rod and I want you to hit that rod. I could never hit the rod on the fence. Never. And it was so frustrating. And he would just pick the ball up and ding, and that one, ding, ding, ding. I'm like, how is that even humanly possible? And this would be a guy that hadn't played baseball in 30 years. Um, so every once in a while he would do something like that that would just blow your mind. Because my dad was a huge storyteller. And if you've ever met my dad, you know that I am under-exaggerating when I say he was a huge storyteller. Um, talk your ear off for hours and hours and hours. Storyteller, painful, painful, painful storyteller. Uh, if you had to listen, uh, but um, I remember meeting some of his friends from when he was he would have been in high school, and they just mentioned that they had never seen a baseball. They never seen anyone play baseball like he did, uh, and he was a shortstop, which is probably the most athletic position on the entire field. Um, and they couldn't just say, yeah, he was good. It was, it was always like, I can't, I mean, I just, the stuff he did, the, I mean, I've never seen anything like that. Um, but the point of that is my dad was such an amazing athlete and his dad never saw him do any sport ever, never, never watched him do any, any sport at all. Um, and my dad never missed anything that I did. Nothing. Really not a practice, not, I mean, not a, uh, a not a game, not a tournament. Um, and, and now I'm 40 years old and I mean, he didn't travel to come see me compete, but, um, I, you know, he gave me money so I could go to Masters World Strongest Man and he watched everything live as it was happening. Um, I competed in, in martial arts last year online doing a, a bow kata, and that was big for him because that was something 
you know, the training and competing, everything, that's something we always did as a family. And then I got away from that as I got older. So to come back and to, you know, compete online with a bow cut, and I can't fight because I'm, I'm taking a lot of medication and I'm not supposed to get hit because I bruise really easy and any kind of brain hit could be a serious issue. But, um, you know, I never missed a thing. And I think there's something, something about that. So there's, there's a lesson there. Uh, I, I, and, and all these lessons, I don't think that, I mean, he never said anything, but I always, I, I learned that when you're in the car and a good song comes on the radio, you stay in the car until the, until the song finishes. And I would like to turn that into some kind of big moral life lesson story, but I don't think it is. I don't think it's anything more than if a good song comes on the radio when you park the car, sit in the car and you finish that, you finish the song. Um, and, and that was not anything we ever talked about, ever, never mentioned it. But it's something that I picked up that if a good song was on the radio, he was going to finish it. And he comes from a time period where a song on the radio would have only been two minutes long. So it wouldn't have been that long anyway. Um, you know, but if you're sitting there to an Almond Band Brothers song, uh, it, it could take a few minutes. Um, I also learned that if you want something, never say no. Never let anyone else tell you no. I think, uh, I think that was a big, that was a big thing for him. And he never said it. But, you know, if you ever went over to the house, he always had a giant calculator. Always had a giant calculator. Uh, my dad was a genius in every sense of the term. And I don't mean he was really smart. I mean, he was a genius. Uh, and, you know, we're going, we're thinking like 30, 40 years, he always had a calculator in his hand doing math. Um, what kind of math? I don't know. Just nonstop math. But I never, I never came up with anything that I wanted that he ever said no to. Uh, he was a big fan of reverse psychology, and he, he even said it all the time. But he would sit down. You know, I would come, come home as a teenager and say, I want to I buy a Harley. Okay, which one do you want? Let's pick it out. Let's go to the Harley dealership on Saturday. You want to go to Paducah? You want to go to Nashville? You want to go to both? We'll leave early and we'll go to both on the same day. There's one up in Illinois we can go to as well. You want to go to that one too? We would get up and go. Um, come home, look at magazines. This was before the internet. And sit down and, and pick out everything you want. How much is it? What are the payments going to be? And then you look at it. And you keep looking at it. You keep looking at it. We did the same thing. I wanted a dual sport. Um, was it a KTM? Uh, motorcycle? Drove and looked at it. Sat down. He came back home. Uh, looked at it again. Went back and came back home and um, figured out what the payments were going to be. Well, you want this bike? This is what the payments are going to be. And he knew what the payments were off the top of his head. He could pull out all the financing, how many months, what the interest rate was going to be. I really mean he was a genius when it came to numbers. Uh, and it would basically get to the point to where, okay, this is how many hours a week you're going to have to work to pay for it. When are you going to ride it? And, he, and the thing was, he came from a time period where when he wanted something, he went to work and bought it. Bought everything. No help from his... He bought it and he worked for every, worked every minute, every hour to buy whatever he wanted. Um, and and I, I think that... I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's what he wanted me to think. I don't know how many... I've always dreamed of getting a Suburban. Uh, and, you know, we, I found a couple... I've, a Suburban, a Corvette. Uh, we found a beautiful white one that is still my dream Corvette. Late 70s model with lake pipes and... Chrome, white. I don't like white cars, but this, that white one, oh my goodness. We found one and, and I test drove it and I put the gas pedal to the floor and it just did nothing. And then he's in a car telling me, put it down, see how fast it'll go. I'm like, Dad, that's it. This is, that's as fast as it'll go. Um, so obviously I wasn't interested in that. We found a Suburban that was just sharp, man. I mean, sharp. It did the same thing, had no power, nothing, something wrong with it. Um, and then we, you know, um, four or five years before I, I left, um, I found the Suburban for me and figured out the payments and worked it out and bought it. It was, it was one of the few things that we sat down and uh, I wanted bad enough to find a way to make the payments. Um, I, he never said no. 
he was the kind of person that believed that a man should have dreams. And you should do whatever you can to figure out what it would take to make that dream come true. And if you've done everything and figured out what it's going to take to make that dream come true, then and only then can you make the decision about is it worth it? Is it worth the give and take to make your dream come true? And a lot of times it's not. A lot of times it's not your dream. Maybe that's what he wanted me to understand. Maybe that's what, you know, him being the older person, me being the younger person, wanted me to look out and say, hey, man, think about what you're going to have to give up to get what you think you want. But if you want a car, go out and buy the car. I remember talking to him a couple of months ago, him going down the list of, he, I'm sitting on the computer saying, search this car, search, I had one of those. Now search this, it was in that collar. And I'm looking at it thinking, man, that's awesome. And him telling me how much he had to pay for that and had to work for it, had to do for it. you know. And then he you know, came to the end, he's like, but if you don't like it, just sell it. That's fine. If you keep it for a year or two and it loses value, it doesn't matter because that value, he's telling me this, that value was you having the car and enjoying it. You know, and here he is, 75, telling me, you know, who's 44, about how much he loved that car and all the good pluses. And I guarantee you that was worth, him telling me about it was worth every bit of payment that he had to pay on this, this car that he was so sorry that, that uh, he no longer has. Um, 56 Chevys and um, I mean, just, you know, some amazing cars that are just, you're just like, you had that car? You know, Chevelles and... Um, I, I think those are the things that, that I learned. Um, do everything you can to be there for your kids. Um, never get out of the car when there's a good song on the radio. Maybe that's the most important one. And if you want something, figure out what it's going to take for you to have it. And if you still want it, no matter how impractical it is, get it. Absolutely get it. Three things that I learned from my dad. Uh,